various aspects that we have been working on. And uh, I should also mention, and the, as you would understand, based on the current situation, the research is, you know, going at a very slow pace. And uh, therefore, you know, uh, I, I, I will not have too many different new things, but I am uh, reasonably certain that everyone will have something new to look for uh, in this talk, even if you had listened to me uh, in March uh, 2020. So, uh, what are we uh, 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 discussing today? Uh, what I want to cover is the uh, antenna, beam steering antenna related work that we have been doing over the past uh, few years uh, to build a functional uh, antenna for 5G, millimeter of 5G communications at uh, 26 or 28 gigahertz uh, applications. So we'll briefly, very briefly start with uh, antenna fundamentals and the design to lead us to this design and uh, the various building blocks that could be used in the antenna beam steering. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some interesting uh, new twists that we have uh, found in the array synthesis as it requires to be applied for uh, this type of uh, antenna applications. So, uh, and I also will uh, cover uh, briefly some uh, interesting uh, new concepts that we are taking up for the research uh, in terms of uh, quantifying uncertainty, manufacturing uncertainty in the, you know, in the, at the design stage for RF microwave millimeter wave uh, applications. And you will see why that is relevant, especially in the context of the, you know, turrets and millimeter wave devices and circuits that uh, we deal with in the workshop today. Um, uh, feel free uh, feel free to interrupt if you have serious questions or you could uh, uh, follow the uh, instructions of the organizers and if they wish to we could put it in their chat box and then uh, we can have I should also mention that all these are based on uh, very very recent and uh, ongoing work some of which is not yet you know I would say published or up so the uh, talk will be, uh, you know, in some way split in terms of the uh, antenna design and then its feed circuit and the array related concepts and very briefly uh, our ongoing efforts towards the frequency up and down converters uh, for this uh, application. If we look at the uh, a millimeter wave antenna array for 5G. There are several very interesting uh, characteristics that one could see compared to what we are used to in you know in the antenna design uh, in most of the other requirements. And one of them is uh, related to the fact that the antenna size, uh, the number of elements is very moderate in a given array based on various uh, you know, constraints that you will see, and I'll talk about it uh, soon. But being in a requirement for communication applications, one would still need you know, 360 degree azimuth coverage. And therefore, you know, uh, and also you may need uh, coverage in both uh, azimuth and elevation planes. So that you will be able to, uh, you know, uh, do justice to users all around you. Unlike other bands of communication at lower frequencies, it turns out that, uh, you know, one uh, may entirely or partly use uh, uh, phased arrays. And in the in the context of uh, communication engineers. They call this analog beam steering. 
because it is different from the you know digital uh, you know baseband beam steering that they are used to but as far as we are concerned uh, the main building block is actually a phased array as we are all uh, as it is known to all of us for you know uh, generations i would say but there is a, of course a possibility of having a you know a hybrid of digital and analog based by, uh, analog uh, uh, beam steering for this application but i will uh, restrict myself to the analog beam steering uh, using phase arrays but you know uh, from the uh, rf engineers perspective it's actually a digitally controlled phase array not analog controlled phase array so in that sense you know it's uh, the it, it it gets more and more confusing as you go more and more deeper into uh, the terminologies but it's actually a, you know let's just uh, for the time being let's just uh, uh, note that it is a phase array that we are uh, speaking about obviously at millimeter wave frequencies we will be using directional antenna elements and in 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 this particular case i'll be talking about micro strip patches as the antenna elements uh this may have some gain of maybe you know 4 to 7 db db gain so therefore there will be some interesting aspects that one we need to consider because most of the antenna array synthesis approaches assume isotropic or omni antenna elements and you will see why i am talking about it as we move on because of the uh, size of the antenna element involved and the uh, uh, periodicity half wavelength approximately half wavelength which happens to be you know uh, about 5 mm 5 or 6 mm as we can practically you know position them uh the uh, and the ic size that we had you we were using is of the order of i6 mm therefore and uh, the ic the particular ic that we were using could control four antenna elements and therefore you know it turned out that each antenna element is connected to one let's say output or a, you know connection of the uh, ic and therefore you know it, it the performance of the array is uh, very closely intertwined with what this uh, ic or you know this particular uh, device can provide so therefore it's it's more closely you know associated the overall performance of the array that we can get is very closely associated with what this can provide and therefore it's more like a very involved co design as far as you know the tr modules and the antenna array are concerned the tr module in this particular case being just this you know particular ic that i was talking about so we have been using uh, a, an ic0108 from a company called anokif in the usa for uh, this particular application so as i said we use a micro strip patch antenna with the center frequency either you know two different designs were under consideration one with a center frequency around 25 uh, gigahertz and another around 28 gigahertz so that's the patch antenna and you know there is you know one would say one would uh, begin to think that you know patch antenna is known now for at least 40 50 years and you know many of us have been working on it for a very very long time and what is there to talk about and it becomes challenging once we say that it has to be integrated with the ic and this ic as i said has uh, you know one common uh, tr input and four different output for the for antenna elements that it can actually feed and the ic has a footprint of about 6 mm by 6 mm and the, and you consider now that the you know antenna size at uh, uh, 28 or 
26 gigahertz is of the order of 3 to 4 mm. And the antenna spacing ideally would have, it would be something of the order of uh, 5 mm. So uh, that's the reason why I said it is very closely, you know, uh, connected. Now, you know, obviously one cannot put the IC along with the antenna on the same plane. And the IC obviously also has to be controlled. It also has to be powered. And therefore, all these have to be incorporated. So the way that we were trying to do was to have the uh, antenna on uh, on the on the, on one side of the multi-layered board, and on the other side of the board where I have written as the microscript line is where actually the uh, IC will be sitting, and you know there is there has to be a connection across the board to reach the antenna through you know something that we are all used to. It could be called a probe feed or a you know via feed kind of a connection between the transmission line to the antenna. The FR4 control layers that I have uh, shown here of approximately one mm is not just one you know a dummy material it could actually consist of four to six different layers uh, for power con uh, control various control lines clock signals and all all those things uh, that are required for the uh, connection uh, for uh, the ic but there are also other challenges because we are now feeding an antenna uh, in an array from the opposite side, and you have a ground conductor in between. And if you look at it, the the entire uh, fields on the let's say the microstrip line side for argument's sake on the on below, the entire field is below the ground plane that you see next to the microstrip line. Uh, whereas on the and patch antenna, the return currents have to terminate in the ground plane closer to it. So these two ground planes have to be sort of connected together or in sync. And, you know, therefore, you know, there are additional, you know, special considerations have to be incorporated to ensure the antenna performance follows what uh, we even simulate or we expect. Uh, I don't think I need to uh, talk in detail about a microstrip antenna to this audience, but you know, typically you design the antenna on a board which has uh, thickness far less than a, a wavelength with a conductor which, whose thickness is even smaller. And the dielectric constant of the material that is used for these antennas could range typically between two to 10 uh in most applications we were using some of the uh Rogers boards for our uh, simulations and early fabrications it has all these textbook advantages and uh, some of the advanced features that one can you know uh, think of and many of those are you know obviously handy when it comes to even the millimeter wave applications that we are uh, talking the uh, microstrip antenna textbook methods of feeding would consist of a, you know, uh, a coaxial or a prop feed where you have an antenna uh, next on a dielectric substrate and on the other side of the dielectric, you have a conductor and then you use a, you know, a pin or a probe to connect from uh, the coaxial connections in the back side. Uh, in plane connections, typically we use a, you know, we could use a, a microstrip line which is inset into the patch antenna for the feed. There are other approaches such as aperture coupled, wherein the microstrip line is spaced with a dielectric on the other side of uh, the ground line, which is somewhat similar to what we have here. Or there is also a possibility of a proximity coupled where the microstrip line, let us say, is on the same side as the patch uh, of the uh, ground plane. We have attempted many of these configurations 
but the one that we are uh, I'm showing today is very is closer to the first approach although we are not directly connecting a coaxial line there we are actually connecting a you know a transmission line uh, printer transmission line on the other side of the um, we have attempted something similar to this aperture coupled feed, but then we are yet to fabricate. So I am not in. I'm not going to talk about it uh, in in this talk. Okay. So, uh, but and there are also several you know design challenges in uh, micro strip antennas. Conventionally, if you look at it, most of the you know uh, uh, early designs of microscopic antennas have uh, narrow bandwidth. Uh, and therefore, uh, research has been on for, you know, dual band or multi-frequency or wide band operation of microscopic antennas. We have been, you know, um, my students who are working on some of these topics, maybe 10 or 15 years back, uh, sort of stopped working in that direction uh, for, uh, for some time now. There are several uh, techniques with which you could achieve uh, broadband performance, especially for the low microwave frequencies. In our context, when we say, you know, one or one gigahertz bandwidth over 30 gigahertz, it is still, you know, it's relatively speaking, it's a one over 30. So it's like, you know, something close to 3% bandwidth. So it is, by that definition, it's not a, very a great bandwidth that is required for it. But the catch is essentially that we have to ensure that it has good efficiency and some of the other characteristics. That we have. So considering some of uh, all these points in mind, we started with a design which is shown in the picture on the top, which is like you have a micro strip line connected to a patch antenna on the other side using a you know, a direct pin connection or a VR connection. And, uh, you know, it, it gives reasonable performance. So you could see that if we could get off the order of two uh, gigahertz. We also tried with different uh, uh, dielectric substrates for various reasons, more because of availability and fabricability and related reasons. And eventually we, uh, you know, uh, um, zeroed in on one with, let's say the manufacturer, the PCB manufacturer can provide and therefore, you know, the decisions were more uh, aligned with those considerations than the probably the best possible or any such thing. Now, in order to con ensure that the ground planes of the micro strip and Antenna and the micros and the line on the opposite side are on the same um, potential over this uh, dimensions that we are talking about. You know, fraction of a wavelength at this frequency. We needed to ensure that these are connected together sufficiently, and therefore we, you know, provided what we call as these fencing vias all around the patch antenna between the two uh, ground conductors. And any of you who have actually attempted uh, building multi-layered boards would realize that it is actually a huge task if we ask someone to fabricate a via from a buried layer or a hidden layer into another hidden layer. So we had to make a lot of compromises in the, uh, you know, the, in the performance of the antenna just to ensure the fabricability of these vias that are needed here. Uh, although I have shown it as uh, flat strips here, what we eventually used are, you know, the regular uh, uh, circular vias that one can drill a hole and connect across. So the performance that we could get is somewhat reasonable in terms of the bandwidth, in terms of the gain, and in terms of the radiation pattern for any of the substrates. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the early designs had, you know, uh, of the order of uh, 2 gigahertz, 10 dB bandwidth, and again above 5 uh, dB and a very nice cross-polarization. 
But once you start putting these uh, fencing vias, as I said, the way that you know a fabricator would allow us to put, you know, these some of these started going away. And we had to, as I said, we had to compromise on some of the performances uh, on these counts. But you know, as you could see, we have uh, you know at, uh, at least about one gigahertz bandwidth. The you know the standard sort of says 400 megahertz is still not clear how it is being applied and things like that. But uh, 400 megahertz, which uh, we are expecting that it will definitely have. So uh, uh, about a year and a half back, we have actually uh, you know, completed the design of a uh, two by two uh, antenna that is like a four element antenna, all fed by one single IC at the bottom and uh, you know, connected through VIAs. And uh, you know, and what you see on this board here are you know, uh, power supply connections and control connections. And this, of course, is the RF connection uh, that is going into the IC. Uh, so uh, the uh, IC that I'm talking about is uh, uh, from a company called uh, Energy Wave, uh, and uh, they uh, specify this for the 26 to 29.5 gigahertz frequency band, which is typically the US. Uh, band of operation and in India it is on the lower edge of this it's uh, although the government has not announced the exact frequency band yet uh, it's uh, expected to be somewhere close to uh, you know 26 gigahertz uh, as it stands now uh, they claim a, a op1 db of uh, plus 9 dbm we are uh, expecting it to behave like you know 0 dbm for each of the antenna connections it has around 26 dB uh, gain, both on the transmit side and the receive side, and 5 dB uh, noise floor uh, when it is received. Uh, of more, in, import, in, more interest for us in the design are the, the, these three points here, which is it uses a 5-bit phase control. That means it has a you know a LSP of about uh, LSP of about 11.25 degrees and interestingly with a five degree rms error what we realized is that some steps is uh, you know only getting you seven degrees and then some other steps will give you 13 uh, degree steps so it is not that it is like uh, sporadic it is almost uh, you know very consistently across the board uh, another point of concern was actually about the uh, the amplitude control you when you use five bit you can only have you know uh, 32 discrete levels and these discrete levels have you know a steps of 1 db and therefore these two uh, actually cause the side low performance of the antenna array to degrade and of more importance sometimes is actually the dynamic range because as you see so the 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 gain control is of uh, you know 0 to 30 one db and therefore the dynamic range of this ic each each line of this ic is 31 db and this incidentally also has uh, relevance when it comes to the array synthesis uh, some of the other characteristics are listed here it's about 6 mm qfn package and can directly support for uh, antenna elements and you know consumes uh, you know about 500 milliampere current at 1.8 volt. So this was the uh, board that we had, uh, you know, design the card drawing of the board that we had. Uh, we had, and this is actually the fabricated board, which you know almost looks similar to what you saw uh, in the you know in the cat. So we're tested in the chamber here. And as you could see, even with the because it is just using a two elements, the beam width is fairly broad, but you could still, you know, show that you can steer the beam, uh, you know, uh, by using appropriate uh, phase weights uh, across these elements. Uh, the uh, you know the design job does not end there because 
to do this phase uh, shift, one has to, uh, you know, talk with the IC using a digital control, and uh, it has to be, you know, uh, interfaced. As it turns out, that we had uh, tried to interface it using an Arduino. Later on, we also worked with an FPGA interface and uh, had several interesting challenges, including one has to write our own, uh, you know, GUI, uh, uh, GUI on, uh, you know, which eventually we wrote on a Python. So, which looks somewhat like this, where you can, you know, test it for transmit mode, receive mode, or something like a fast speed switching mode. And uh, because of uh, some uh, interesting, uh, you know, limitations, uh, you know, we, we initially started with an Arduino with a breadboard, and then there is a interposal connections, and which all of these are finally integrated into a nice, add-on board for the Arduino, uh, with which you could directly connect from a laptop to this Arduino, and then through which we could control the IC for, you know, testing this. So uh, around um, uh, earlier this year, we were able to now use this antenna array that you just saw, along with, uh, you know, um, uh, ready, Really available up converter modules, frequency synthesizers, and and the like, to basically transmit uh, a millimeter wave uh, waveform, and then receive it using an antenna and down curve, and then you know connect it into let's say a a, a client device. Uh, at that at that stage, this is where uh, this is about uh, uh, you know February March of uh, uh, this year. Um, that's what we were uh, doing at that time to basically transmit, and we were in full swing uh, trying to you know uh, communicate using this millimeter wave uh, radios inside these boats with all these modules that I just saw in the previous uh, slide. Uh, communicating across uh, something like 8 to 12 meters in a corridor. And we we're able to actually transmit a, a video uh, using that link and, you know, uh, show it on the other side. Probably you can see on the computer screen in, in here. Uh, and it also includes, as you see, these multiple uh, blocks, including the up-down conversion. So uh, since then, we have been uh, trying to uh, finalize and you know fabricate uh, the up-down converters of our own, uh, you know, which is in fact a work in progress. Not uh, the IC is, uh, I mean, the board is uh, uh, under revision at this stage. Now, this is a, a, a typical test setup as it is being done in the age of. Uh, lockdown and you know social distancing and the like so what we are trying to do is uh, testing of this two by two antenna on this table uh, using a horn on the other side to basically check the control and other functionalities uh, the uh, transmit antenna is connected to a vector signal generator the receive antenna in this case is connected to a vector signal analyzer a, um, a spectrum analyzer on the other side, which is not in, uh, not captured in this picture. And as you could see, multiple computer screens, one for the control, one for you know analyzing the received waveform and things like that. And you may see one uh, another guest here, which is actually a, a camera. This is because you know uh, my students are still away. This is someone from. I guess indoor or someplace, talking to the, you know, looking at the screen and making changes that is needed as uh, the one student who is here, who is actually setting up the experiments, you know, uh, you can see him maybe this, you know, kind of here. So, uh, you know, that's how life is now. So obviously, you know, things are progressing at a relatively slower pace. But you know there is still something that we can discuss. 
So the next step for us was to actually build a larger antenna array. Uh, it's what we decided to do was actually a 16 by 4 antenna array. And as you could see, it requires, you know, 16 ICs with a power divider network and uh, all the controls and power that are needed for uh, this. Now, uh, you know, when you talk about power divider, the simplest thing that comes to our mind is something similar to a Wilkinson power divider on a micro strip line, which obviously is... Uh, you know, uh, micro strips are not very uh, convenient at these high frequencies because of the uh, excitation of multiple modes. So we were using actually a coupler wavekite. Now uh, we can look at the power divider that you know that I'm showing here. Um, as you could see, the feed lines are coplanar waveguide with grounded, uh, it could be called a grounded uh, coplanar waveguide. But what about the power divider here? It is neither microstrip uh, nor coplanar waveguide because the individual sections do not have ground on either side of those. And at the same time, this is not even a coupled line because you know it is different from we, these are supposed to be two separate arms. So the design of the power divider was a very interesting challenge uh, at this frequency. And it, it, it was actually done in situ by you know, playing with multiple factors, including the dimensions, the taper that you see here, and also the via uh, pins and the like. And it follows nothing of the test design. But uh, as it stands, it works and uh, we could move, move forward. So uh, this is the close-up view of the, uh, the power dividers being connected and the, and the entire network. And you could see that there are, you know, uh, if you actually uh, see it carefully, these lines are actually coplanar waveguide. And it is, uh, you may see it as three lines because the rest of it is masked out. And this is, uh, you know, having uh, grounded CPW with PRs all over. Uh, the board is also ready for uh, being, it is being tested as it stands now. Uh, so it has uh, been fabricated and mounted. Uh, all the components are assembled and we are still in the process of uh, uh, completing the, these tests. Now that would also require a you know a, a much more in, increased capability for the interposer. So the Python with the PC with the Python I have already mentioned. Then you have this Arduino, and then there is this interposer board which is actually uh, connected to the Arduino, which is actually controlling the all the ICs. Now you know each of these antennas have to be you know told what amplitude and phase it has to operate with so therefore you know it turns out that it, it is uh, controlling the board would require passing a 1600 bit uh, word uh, for you know each uh, intended uh, positions of the beam that you will uh, uh, read so uh, that's something that is going on as and as it is, let's talk a little about the requirements for the antenna array in a different perspective. Now, if you only look at the uh, you know uh, antenna as synthesis from the path loss or the link calculations, you can see that from one gigahertz to you know thirty gigahertz, there is actually uh, something uh, 30 dB difference in the power, you know, one can receive because of the free space loss alone. And uh, in addition, there are additional losses, and therefore, you know, one requires a high directivity antenna to compensate for all of these. And when you have high directivity, obviously, it's a narrower beam. And when you have a narrower beam to cover the full space, you need to have a phase array. To and that's what the that is why this IC had to be included in the in the design. So 
Now, at millimeter phase, when we are trying to do uh, you know, the full coverage, what we finally decided is that we use four different panels of the type that we saw to uh, cover four quadrants so that we can, whenever, whenever you need full 360 degree coverage. And uh, there are, um, um, there could be other issues that one may have to consider, but something that we started out with is actually, you know, uh, when these arrays have a taper, you know, the synthesis is something, uh, you know, requires something interesting. Now, why am I talking about it? Uh, this is the actual, uh, you know, beam uh, pattern that we can predict. When you have a 16 by 4 antenna array, uh, which is excited uniformly, so all the you know different uh, uh, antennas, all these antennas are the same power, and this is the directivity that we can expect. In the two planes, in as you note, in one plane it is it has uh, four elements, and in the other plane it has you know, 16 elements. Now we attempted a different. Uh, you know, tapering schemes. There is something called discrete uh, parallel spheroidal scheme, uh, which can actually improve the cyclo level uh, characteristics. You know, in the in the uniform, uh, uh, you could get three point six, whereas here you could actually play with some numbers to uh, get to change your cyclo levels. And um, at this stage. Um, we have worked out a, a scheme with which we don't exploit the full dynamic range of the IC uh, because the you know the power that you net power that you radiate will be affected. So therefore, this is essentially a compromise performance uh, in, with regard to the maximum power versus the side lobe level that we have currently arrived at. And as you could see, it gives. Uh, uh, close to 20 dB, 20, 25 dB cycle of love. Now, the antenna array synthesis usually follows an isotropic radiator. And, uh, you know, when you want to steer the beam, uh, you can, uh, you know, get the beam following the array factor. But when the uh, antenna element is directional, as in this case, what happens is that the uh, scanned beam uh, has an offset in the direction and also has a uh, different side low performance than the mid beam. And these we have been looking at for some a couple of years now, trying to figure out how to overcome this situation and ensure that we do have, uh, you know, uh, performance consistent across uh, for uh, different scan coverage. So when we look at this uh, DPSS um, uh, weighting scheme for, let's say, 30, 45, 30 in theta direction and 45 in phi direction, uh, elevation and azimuth as it stands, by include when we include the, the uh, uh, this is the array factor that we can get, and as you could see, it is you know terrible. And the reasons for that is essentially because three factors that I had pointed out earlier. One is the dynamic range of the IC. So it turns out that uh, because of the 31 dB dynamic range, when for example, when you have a 64 element linear array, the uh, end element values are because of the, uh, and similarly, because of the amplitude quantization, the values that you can provide for the individual antenna elements are also at these discrete levels. And both of these have an impact on site low performance. And the problem gets worse if you actually target much uh, more, uh, you know, uh, than a range of values for the individual elements. Typically, that would be required when you want much larger uh, side lobe level, much improved side lobe level performance of the array. Similarly, we have also noticed that you know because of the quantization in the amplitudes and phases, 
you will actually see the cyclope levels of the array uh, performing worse than what would happen in the normal uh, situations. And uh, so we were on detailed analysis. We have actually found that you know the number of weights that is used uh, in the phase shifter and the you know the gain controlled could actually be one of the reasons for the performance degradation that we see. And given that uh, we have to live with this IC, we are also exploring ways of you know compensating for. Uh, these kind of performance degradations, and it turned out that a simple, uh, you know, trick of you know converting the phase, and you know, in a phase array, you have to uh, convert the analog phase number to a digital uh, phase numbers to be able to control it digitally. So in this case, what we have found is that instead of doing all the phases separately. If you actually, uh, you know, uh, quantize the first possible phase and then apply it across for the entire array, we are able to, you know, improve the uh, overall array performance. And as you could see, uh, I think let me just skip some of these in the interest of time. Uh, what we can, what we have found is that. Uh, by following a scheme like the one that I just mentioned, uh, we can improve the side lobe level performance to something that the ideal uh, uh, weights would have given uh, by, you know, uh, by a, this simple trick of uh, phase control in the, in the very, at the various elements of the antenna array. It does have some uh, issues when you actually steal the beam. Because you can't really control the beam with very fine uh, accuracy, but then in the for the kind of array that we're talking about, and for the uh, which is only having 16 elements in one direction, and for the kind of uh, you know uh, side lobe performances that we are targeting, we found that you know it performs nearly on par with uh, you know the ideal performance would have given, uh, and overcome some of the Comes that you would see in the uh, side lobes as you steer the beam, uh, in, in which which actually was uh, coming due to the uh, errors in errors caused by the quantization of the uh, elements, and it's consistent across uh, different angles. The two indicative angles are shown. Uh, so. When you uh, we have uh, now almost in a position to uh, you know do these weights to this antenna, and uh, you know currently the expected pattern would look something like this, which is as I said somewhat decent. Even when it is steered, we are getting all uh, close to 18 to 20 dB side lobe level at this. Very briefly, I want to touch upon uh, one more topic of research that we are looking at. Which is trying to see, uh, trying to incorporate the fabrication uncertainties in the antenna design. There are several random defects that could happen in, uh, you know, uh, boards or devices that you make for millimeter day or terahertz application. There could be variations in material properties. There could be changes in uniformity, differences in dimensions in at various parts because of the manufacturing precision issues, and all this impact could have a cumulative effect in the overall performance. Uh, you know that we can get out of the uh, uh, board system that we actually fabricate. In short, it could be in terms of the dielectric constant. It could be in terms of the geometry or dimensions, or sometimes it could be in terms of the surface roughness. And these effects do propagate in your EEM model. So what essentially requires is that the input to the EM model may have to incorporate these um, randomness so that we can actually evaluate the output as a random uh, a random variation of the output. And from there, we can actually get the random variation in the 
between the test parameters or other characteristics. Is it possible and how is it done? Yes, it is possible. You, you know, and typically people use what is called Monte Carlo method, where one would require a large number of simulations, and which are, you know, where the inputs are actually randomly generated, which is like, you know, different positions, different dimensions, or whatever uh, those parameters that you would want to consider, and you know, perform as many, uh, you know, simulations and aggregate the results and bring out the statistics of the output. This EM simulation, as all of you would agree, uh, is very time consuming. And it is also time consuming to, um, even more time consuming when it goes to uh, millimeter wave or terahertz speeds. So we have been looking at uh, ways uh, of uh, doing these simulations efficiently, uh, which there are several methods for doing. Uh, let me. Uh, uh, and these could be in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what we call as spectral stochastic finite element method, which would require one to have our own code to do it. I think last time I talked, I talked a little bit more about that. I don't want to talk about it today. We also try to do some uh, approach with which we can modify the CST or console simulation uh, by, you know, uh, taking up very few characteristic simulations and from there uh, evaluate the performance of the statistics of the output. Uh, so some of these are all listed in the in, in some of the literature, more for the uh, applied mechanics uh, domain, but we have borrowed the concepts from there to do our uh, simulations. So in the approach that I want to talk to you over the next three minutes, we looked at uh, a non-intrusive method, meaning we, we didn't build our own code. We essentially used a CST simulation, and the CST computation outcome is used to come up with, uh, you know, to uh, predict the overall stochastic behavior of the system. Uh, so we have tried to look at the effects of permittivity, the effects of dimensions, the effect of, you know, we are in the case of the antenna that we are talking about. And initially we compared it with Monte Carlo simulations. So in, you know, long term, we did it was, yes. Yes, I know. Professor, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So please try to restrict your talk within the next five minutes. No, I'll take only three more minutes. Okay, yes. okay, fine. So the, the CST simulation normally when you do is something similar to this. You start with uh, design parameters, you uh, do a generate a mesh and then solve it and you get some outcome. Whereas in our case, what we try to do was we generate a set of input parameters using a MATLAB code and you know extracted the outcome from CST and then process the result ultimately and come up with the statistics of the outcome from uh, uh, CST. So this can be done for Monte, running Monte Carlo simulations and also for the, the uh, stochastic allocation kind of simulations that I'm talking about. So uh, the simple example, uh, you know, patch antenna designed for 1.6 gigahertz. Well, what would happen if the dimension change? Obvious, the resonance frequency of the antenna could change. And what you see here is that, you know, the resonance frequency of the antenna and the, the dip frequency that you could see is, you know, it can change based on the range of values, the standard deviation of the values that you would choose for the dimensions of the patch. A similar, and, you know, the way that we have done is that, you know, we are able to get the overall uh, uh, performance, this stochastics in something like 10 times the computational cost of a single run that you need. And once you get that, you will be able to predict, you know, uh, for what frequency range uh, the S101 performance would be better than a certain number, or, you know, for what, you know, CCTV bandwidth that you can get for different, you know, standard deviations at the input level. Or one could also see, you know, what's the range of S11 performance, you know, that you could get over the frequency. So 
uh, once it is validated uh, for you know uh, for a local PC, we also took it for the 28 gigahertz patch antenna that I showed earlier. A slightly simpler version of it, just to you know uh, take it to a, a stage it can be validated. So you know as as I mentioned before, you could look at various things as the dimension stage, the S1 on meeting certain threshold the bandwidth meeting certain threshold or the S1 and performance, all derived out of one single simulation that you just mentioned. Similarly, we could look at what happens when the VR radius uh, uh, changes, you know, because that's something that uh, many manufacturers have difficulty in controlling. And you could see, uh, you know, a similar performance variation that you could see with regard to the S1, once again, the gain, uh, uh, the and as well uh, and gain, and uh, the uh, bandwidth that you see in the middle. So all these performance could be significantly uh, affected because of the dimensional thing, and you could see all of it by uh, extending your simulation to this, uh, uh, you know, this stochastic. To summarize. I started with a beam steering antenna using a commercial IC, and then we also looked at some computational techniques to, you know, predict the overall performance. Before I close, I just need to take one more minute uh, to uh, familiarize the audience to some of the other topics that we do. We have been working on RF uh, power transfer, and what you see here is a board that was made. Uh, in which you know we are able to harvest the energy and you know uh, communicate using uh, a standard RFID reader. Uh, what you see on the right side top is actually a meta surface based reconfigurable antenna uh, uh, array that we have developed very recently, with which we are attempting something called media based modulation for communication. Instead, instead of uh, you know uh, modulating the waveform, we are actually transmitting a single tone, but doing all the modulation in space in front of the antenna uh, by using meta surfaces. Uh, okay, so that's all I have here. Uh, open for questions. Yeah, thank you, Professor Vinay, for the wonderful talk. And I got a couple of questions from the chat box. Let me read it out. So one is asking that how to calculate the gain of phase array. So did he have to follow the paper by Dr. Odun Bhattacharya? So what is your, your comment, anything on that one? Right, uh, so at this stage, we, have, uh, we are working with uh, MATLAB-based uh, simulations. And as you, uh, I have not looked at this particular paper that you are you know, referring to. The gain uh, we are actually calculating based on the uh, at this stage we are calculating based on the power output that you can get because you know uh, it is limited by what the IC can provide and also the the, the antenna element gain varies as you steer the beam so that has to be taken into account and uh, thirdly the uh, uh, as you uh, steer the beam, the uh, performance can also have minor uh, changes. In the IC performance can also have minor changes. So, all you know, it's it's far more complex uh, because it is an integrated design. It is not a typical corporate feed arrangement. So, therefore, you know, uh, there there are large variations. I will only put it that way. Okay. And the next one I am getting from V Madhu. V Madhu, are you online? Can you please uh, just unmute and uh, ask your question directly to the speaker? Hello, Vinesh, and this is Mahadevan. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, how are you, sir? Fine. Uh, Fine. Now, my only this thing is I saw the side lobes were all drooping and changing. But generally, in three by five uh, pollen, this one distribution, we got almost a uniform uh, uh, side lobes. So possibly it is due to the way the weighting of amplitudes and some variations of phase which you have got selected may be responsible for that. Yes, 
we were using a dps scheme which is supposed to give you that i i see so this is not exactly then uh, shibisef it is not it is not shibisef it is not shibisef is it but i the the diagram where you showed it showed a shibisef uh, distribution yeah, that's true the the different uh, one uh, we started with a shibisef but what we are currently going with is uh, this scheme so that we can have the you know uh, uh, more pointed beam i'll put it that way Oh, I see. So not is exact. So it's not possibly. Uh, this is not tip show. Yeah, this is uh, as I said, discrete uh, prolet spheroid, uh, spheroidal scheme. I think. Yes. Ah, I see. That's that's great. See, yeah. what what is the other one is? Uh, I saw that you are doing some stochastic uh, uh, ma modeling for a microstrip, but the feeding uh, is uh, something where you give only a signal. No, so do you really model the feeding as to whether it is a slot you uh, a slot coupled or a probe coupled etc well so at this stage we are only uh, validating the method uh, okay. we have not yet uh, uh, extracted the full juice out of the method yet uh, uh -huh. you know because the moment you bring in the uh, aperture coupled and other things all those can be done the catch is that uh, uh, there are more far more input variables you know the alignment issues then the uh, relative positions uh, of yeah, different yeah. layers and all those things will come and as the number of uh, you know independent variables i would say at the input level increase the method also gets uh, more and more complex uh, so we will have to still see how best it, it works in those yeah. this method may be more useful really when you want to have a direct circular polarization from a single patch so you can have a nice uh, uh, methods of uh, variations so that you can give them the uh, give the best solution for cp uh, possible possible yeah yeah that's true so thank you nice talking to you thank you the... uh, i am also getting another question from just one me sandhana mahalingam m if you are there can you please unmute and directly ask the question to speaker hello okay then let me read it out because i don't know whether it's a, it's what we've done could you please comment on the selection of significant parameters from cst mws results to the estimation of probability a bit okay so uh, when you do cst simulations you can get fields at different locations now uh, we can interface cst with matlab to read this information directly into matlab and then what we we essentially do is that we try to evaluate the the you know for example when you are looking at s parameters we basically have to look at the net field at the ports so we evaluate it we evaluate the stochastics of the uh, the out, outcome at the, the, the port impedance or port uh, port fields and then use that to uh, uh, come up with the stochastics of s parameters similarly when you are actually evaluating the gain variations or the directivity variations uh, you know using the you know uh, the uh, using a probe at the right location we are actually taking the field at that location and then you know again once again use uh, uh, extract the, those values from uh, cst using matlab and then you know performing the statistical analysis so it, it depends on the problem and uh, you know and uh, being able to you know interface matlab with uh, you know cst so there were multiple challenges involved in you know getting it to work yeah uh, another question i have uh, got from dr molaranjan tripathi can you please unmute and uh, ask the question directly yeah yeah thank you so much uh, dr somak yeah yeah i was hearing this lecture it is very good at uh, 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 my question is uh, about the smart antenna can we can we use some adaptive uh, beamforming techniques 
to have the dynamic links or something like that. Can you give some suggestion in that direction? Okay, so we were, um, you know, specifically looking at the millimeter wave uh, frequency uh, band. And it turns out that the, the cost of the hardware as it stands today for this up conversion and down conversion that you see here is, uh, and the bill of material cost of that is more than everything else on this board that you see on, uh, on, on the screen that you see here. So therefore, it is uh, uh, the, the uh, let's say the, from a cost perspective, uh, the the conventional um, communication, the digital beam steering uh, idea, where you have multiple um, up converters, down converters thing, uh, will not be feasible at 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 this stage. Okay, maybe okay. three years, five years down the line, things the cost factor may change, and maybe it may become feasible. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, at this stage, one can uh, the best that one can do would be to have fewer of these, uh, you know, up down converters, and uh, use, uh, uh, you know, the the typical antenna arrays for doing the beam steering, than you know, doing the entire thing at the baseband and doing the beam beam steering using baseband. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there any other, if, if you have any further question, please unmute and directly ask to Professor Vinay. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. So if anyone has, they can maybe email to me and maybe I can answer it some other point of time. So, so uh, maybe we can close. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you, Professor Vinay, for the wonderful talk, and it's a really informative one. So uh, may, may I hand it over to Professor Chinmoy Shaha, if you are available? So please take over the stage. Hello. Okay, okay then let me ask uh, Shivada, you please carry on. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the uh, amazing lecture on uh, phase arrays for millimeter wave applications. So uh, it was such a wonderful lecture. So uh, the participants, uh, the evening from 6 p.m. we have a session by uh, Dr. Gaurab Banerjee, sir, from uh, IISC Bangalore, and by uh, Dr. Kaushik Sengupto, sir from uh, Princeton University. He is uh, IEEE MTTS DML 2021 20, to 23. So hope you hoping to meet you all there all. as well. Now I invite Dr. Shinmoy Saha sir for further proceeding. So if you are available, please unmute. Okay. Um, Professor Shaha is not there at his desk. No, I just Okay. Cut back. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, uh, two things are happening together. So Professor Vinay, you are there. Thank you. So yeah, much. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation and uh, had a very wonderful talk based on majority of the work that you are doing. Uh, so thank you very much on behalf of MTTS Kerala. Professor Binoy doesn't uh, need any you know, introduction. He has contributed immensely. So I thank all the audience for being over here. And he has been very generous uh, on various occasions uh, to me and to some of my students uh, for giving some chances to work in his lab. So one of my former students uh, did some uh, work with him. So. That's a very good thing. And uh, he's also one of the leaders of uh, MTT Society, very much involved with uh, MTT conference, IMARC, etc. So on behalf of the chapter, on behalf of uh, IEEE MTTS, I once again thank you. And also thanks to the session chair, Dr. Kshomar Bhattacharya. So 
I think with this we conclude the first half of the day and we are looking forward to two more talks which are still in the evening. Uh, the first one will be by uh, Dr. Gaurav Banerjee and Bangalore, I see Bangalore. And then we have Kovic uh, from Princeton. We are looking forward to those talks uh, for the second session. Okay, so thank you very much for being with us. It has been a very tough but very eventful year and uh, we have uh, tried our level best to cater to the needs to the students academic fronts in all possible ways amidst the pandemic so thank you all and look forward to see you in the evening thank you very much professor binoy thank you uh, very much dr shomo yeah. thank you thank you thank you bye bye